Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing electrical safety, particularly where it pertains to hobbyist electronics where, in which uh, elevated voltages above the minimum or the maximum safe voltage for human contact may be present. Now, before I start this video, I'd like to preface it by saying that I am not an electrician and I don't have any formalized training in electrical safety. So I am liable to make mistakes in this video and anything you say, anything I say in this video should be verified against a more reputable source if you're going to take it as, a, uh, as an actual life safety precaution. Now I'm going to start by uh, mentioning the types of electrical uh, conditions that I'm going to be discussing in this video are all, non, are all below medium voltage, that is less than 600 volts, and at relatively low frequencies, that is around 60, 60 hertz or less. Electricity can behave very strangely at elevated voltages and frequencies above these levels, and that, uh, those topics and the safety issues surrounding those would be better covered in a future video or uh, altogether in an entire course. I mean, it's, uh, electricity can behave very strangely when the frequency and voltage are high. So for today's video, we're talking about less than uh, 600 volts, and also less than 60 hertz, or less than or equal to 60 hertz, because this is going to be applicable to mains voltage. Now, the three main categories that you can divide the, elect the hazards associated with elect working with electricity into are the biggest uh, hazard probably for the hobbyist, which is electrical shock. Another hazard, which is probably more applicable to large-scale industrial applications, but could still be encountered under the right conditions by a hobbyist, which is arc flash. And a condition that would result from uh, improper installations or unsafe installations of existing electrical uh, technology or with projects that hobbyists may work on, which is fire hazard. Now between these three, I'm not going to talk as much about arc flash or fire hazard, although they are uh, certainly topics which are critical to understand if you're going to be working on elevated voltage circuits. Today, the main topic I'm going to be emphasizing is electrical shock and how to avoid it. Now in today's video, I'm going to be discussing both uh, conditions of working in live circuits as well as conditions where in which you're not directly working in live circuits, but you're creating conditions where people could be exposed to these live circuits. So I'm going to start out mainly by uh, discussing how you can avoid uh, putting yourself in a hazardous situation if you're working around energized circuits and then proceed to show you how to work safely in those circuits as well. So we'll get on to that next. So before I discuss specific practices for working in live circuits, I wanna first emphasize or uh, indicate some models by which you can describe the hazards of electric shock. Now, ultimately, what the biggest issue involved, uh, the biggest issue involved in electrical shock that tends to produce uh, the most fatalities is due to ventricular fibrillation in the heart, or V-fib. Now, ventricular fibrillation occurs when the heart muscle is uh, exposed to an electrical current which is sufficient to disrupt its normal rhythm. And as a result of this, uh, the ventricles of the heart don't pump properly and this can result in reduced blood flow to the brain and can also encourage the formation of blood clots in the bloodstream. Now this occurs when the arm-to-arm -arm current, that is the roughly the current from one hand to the next, is approximately 100 milliamps or greater. Now this can also occur with less current than 100 milliamps. Uh, everywhere, anywhere down to around 50 milliamps can be harmful, but there are other conditions which can also lead to hazards where relatively low currents are present, but sufficient current is passed through uh, skeletal muscles that it can cause you to actually clench on to what you're working on and not be able to let go. So there's a couple of issues that can, that can occur from this. For one thing, over the long term, this can result in nerve damage and degenerative nerve effects. But uh, another problem that this can cause over time is actual physical burning of the tissue. So you can really categorize electrical shock hazards into uh, cardiac hazards, as well as nerve hazards and possible tissue burn hazards. All of these are relevant to an, a hobbyist working in elevated voltages, and you should understand the mediums, uh, or the uh, methods by which these can occur and what the hazards associated with them are. Now, a lot of people will tell you something along the lines of, it's the amps that kill you, not the volts, or volts jolt, amps, or mills kill, things like that. 
And while this is true, and ultimately it is the current that is hazardous, the current cannot flow through your body unless a sufficiently high voltage is present. Now, standards for ELV, or extra low voltage, which is categorized below the low voltage, which contains uh, the household voltages that you're probably going to encounter most often, this ELV is uh, specified as uh, less than 60 volts AC and less than 120 volts of DC, and that's ripple-free DC, so you can't have any superimposed AC on that. Now, this is just one standard. There are many different standards for ELV, and uh, in my experience, what I would recommend is for AC voltages, anything less than around 50 volts is generally safe to touch. Anything less than around 90 volts DC is generally safe to touch. But of course, under the right conditions, even these voltages can be hazardous. So you want to take caution in any case. Now, if you're dealing with uh, voltages above ELV, but below medium voltage, so this would be the 120 volts or 240 volts that you'd encounter in your household, the precautions you're going to take are going to be slightly different and the reasons why you have to be careful are going to be slightly different than those for extra low voltage. Extra low voltage primarily, if any hazard is present, it's going to either indicate fire hazard or arc flash hazard. If there's many, many amps, like behind, what, behind the current behind your car battery, you could have a potential for arc flash or splashing car battery acid around. And if your circuit is in an area where flammables are present and it shorts out or overloads, fire hazard will be present. So both of these are present for ELV. Above ELV, of course, these are both uh, present as well, but then you introduce electrical shock, which is the hazard that we're going to be discussing mostly today. Now, the method by which this actually shocks you is that uh, your body is effectively a resistor, and uh, it, the resistive current across your skin at low voltages is quite high, on the order of one mega ohm, but as soon as you apply any considerable voltage, this reduces substantially. Uh, and in fact, if your skin is wet or uh, if it's damaged, like if you have a cut or something, it can be even lower, potentially as low as 10 kilo ohms, which even at relatively low voltages can, like around 120 volts AC, can produce considerable hazard if it's arm to arm. Now, this is one of the reasons why one of the topics I'll be discussing is when working live, only using one hand in the circuit at a time, because this eliminates the hazard of conducting current across your body and thus across your heart and also being sure that you're not standing on something wet or conductive like a metal plate or a, a puddle of water on a piece of concrete, because this could, of course, conduct current through your body uh, and through your legs. So once this, uh, when you see that the uh, resistance of your skin drops considerably, you only have to look at V equals IR, which is Ohm's law, to see that as the voltage increases, the current will increase as well. So that's why uh, ultimately it's not only the open circuit voltage that's hazardous and the open circuit current that's hazardous, it's the combina or the closed circuit current. It's the combination of the two that creates the hazard. If you don't have a lot of voltage, your 500 amp cranking amp car battery will be harmless. It's only 12 volts. But if you have lots and lots of uh, current, or if you, have lo you have lots of voltage and some available current, even as little as 100 milliamps, it can be very dangerous as well. So next I'm going to move on to discussing some of the ways you can keep your actual workstation safe and you can work safely in a, uh, an elevated voltage condition. Now a lot of places where you may work will actually uh, have specific rules about working on live circuits. Some places will not allow working live at all, other places may require specific certification to work live, but uh, in general a lot of workplaces will generally, generally prohibit working live unless absolutely necessary. And this is definitely a good first line of defense against uh, electric shock in general. However, especially for the hobbyist working in uh, elevated voltage conditions like vacuum tube amplifiers or in other mains referenced or elevated voltage circuits, it's good to know the general safety policies about how to work around mains uh, voltage. Now, above every other mains voltage safety tip that I can possibly give, the most important one that I think I should, uh, I should tell you is understand what paths current will and will not take. This is what's going to allow you to decide what's safe to work on and what is not safe to work on. Now we, you see here this is an electrical outlet. This is not isolated. This is mains reference straight off the power pole, straight from the 20 amp breaker. And uh, as you can see, there's no trickery going on. This is uh, energized, 120 volts. 
Now I am going to take this screwdriver with my fingers grabbed right onto the metal and I'm going to shove it right into the hot pin and absolutely nothing happens. Why does absolutely nothing happen? Because I'm not referenced to anything. I am standing on a tile floor, which is a relatively good insulator, though not a perfect insulator, and I am not referenced at all to the ground. Now when I insert this into the outlet, I'm now referenced to the 120 volts, but there's no uh, actual path for electric current to follow. I can do the same for the neutral. Now if I were also touching that screw at the same time, I would probably receive a nasty shock across my hand, but uh, of course I'm not directly connected to the ground, so I'm not going to have any current go through my actual body in that case. So even though that may look dangerous on the surface, and I certainly don't recommend trying that at home, particularly if you're not experienced in working with high voltage, it's uh, a good exercise in understanding how the electric current will and will not flow. If there's no path to ground, you will not get a shock. If there is a path to ground, you will get a shock. Now some people will tell you that uh, body capacitance, that is the capacitance formed between your body and earth, is sufficient to allow an electric shock to occur if you uh, make contact with a live referenced circuit. And while there is a small amount of capacitance from your body to the earth ground at all times, this is so low that at the low frequencies at this outlet and the low voltages involved, the electric current that flows because of that is negligible. Now, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the tile that I'm standing on is actually slightly conductive. Now, it's not really enough for me to feel any considerable current. I think if I just brush my finger along, I feel a very slight tingle from that. But uh, it's a good idea to consider what surface you're on because although tile is not a very good conductor, if it were wet or if it were a concrete floor and it were wet, the resistance of the actual floor material and the interface between your body and the floor would increase or decrease substantially and allow more current to flow. If that's the case, and if that happens, you could actually be in a lot of trouble. So that's one of the reasons I say that one of the most dangerous combinations is working in mains voltage systems when there's water around, because it reduces your skin's resistance and if it's on the ground, it makes the floor a much better conductor as well. We can actually demonstrate this uh, with a multimeter, which I'll show you in a minute. So here I have set up a wet paper towel that's been soaked in salt water, which is an ionic solution and is very conductive, sitting on a piece of con or sitting on a concrete slab, which is sitting on earth ground. So it's ground referenced. Now I have the black lead of this multimeter connected to the hot side of an electrical outlet, and uh, it's connected on the 200 milliamp range current sense. So that means this plug is directly connected to the black plug through a current sensing resistor. Now if I connect this to the uh, paper towel, you can see that up to 5.3 milliamps of current flows. Now that's a considerable amount. Not quite enough to be hazardous, but it certainly would give you a nasty shock if you touched it. So this is an important thing to notice that if you have a puddle of water on concrete and you're standing in it, you have a relatively low impedance path to ground. So even though concrete may seem like an insulator, for example, if I just strike this across, there's no current flowing, you think it's a good insulator, but uh, it actually can conduct enough current to be hazardous. So keep that in mind when you're um, thinking about how, uh, what electrical shock hazards are present in your work area and whether you need to take greater precautions such as uh, avoiding contact with the circuit altogether or wearing insulating clothing or boots to make sure that you're not going to accidentally create a path into the ground below you. So now that we've gone over ways in which you can uh, be sure and understand the paths that current can take to uh, create an electric shock condition, now I can show you some more tools you can use to potentially avoid the risk of electric shock. The most important of which would be the isolation transformer. Now if you're going to be working around mains voltage and mains referenced equipment, it's a good idea to have an isolation transformer. Now this is a 2 kVA unit, you can actually see a more detailed uh, analysis of in my isolation transformer video. But it's a good tool to have, even if uh, you don't have one as big as this, to just uh, to have on your workbench in case you're going to be working around uh, live mains equipment. Now what an isolation transformer does is it uh, uses a, a transformer core, which is an electromagnetic separator, to keep the uh, mains voltage coming in isolated from the mains voltage coming out. So when this is set on full isolation mode, as you can see, you get power from the output However, if I connect one side here to the hot and the other side to just the case of the transformer, 
there's no current passing. In fact, I could easily just put my finger here and touch the case and not worry about getting shocked either. Now, uh, if I put this on uh, output ground transformer neutral, I can actually force the case to be referenced now to ground. That's uh, just an option I've included in this transformer, but uh, your transformer may or may not have an option like that. So if you do have that, be sure that it's either set to earth ground or floating ground for your output secondary. Now you can learn more about this transformer in my isolation transformers video uh, if you want more information about how that works. Now before I show you workbench safety, another thing I thought I would mention is uh, that in especially the electrician's field, when you're working on say a junction box in an elevated surface or where you're on a ladder or on a roof or anything like that, one of the biggest hazards is not actually the electrical shock. If you have, say you're working on the side of the building and you have a ladder backed up against the building and uh, you're working on that ladder, my drawing is not very good, and you're working in some sort of electrical box, if you get shocked from this electrical box, it may not necessarily be life-threatening, especially if it's just across one hand. However, it could be startling enough or could even produce a uh, muscle contraction which can throw you off of the ladder then thus causing uh, other injury or even a concussion, which could, which could potentially be fatal. So one of the biggest uh, things to consider is if you're going to be working live, know what you're standing on. And even if you're not going to be working live, if you are working in something that could be live, for example, if somebody forgot to properly log, lock out and tag out the breaker, uh, which I should also uh, mention in a future video, but because this is not uh, geared towards industrial electrical applications, I won't mention today, but if, you, uh, if for whatever reason you weren't expecting something to be live and you got a shock off of it, you could fall off of the platform on which you're working and get seriously injured that way. This is actually one of the most common causes of severe injury after electrical shock, not the actual shock itself, but the reaction to it. So always be wary of what's around you and what, uh, what would happen if you were to be shocked by something, if you're going to fall off of something or if you're going to fall back in your chair even at your workstation if you got pushed away from your bench by a muscle contraction. So that's always something to be cognizant about and be wary that uh, it's not necessarily even the shock that will be hazardous, but your reaction to it and what, may, uh, what objects may be around you. Now sometimes it's advisable if you don't have access to an isolation transformer to do your best to set up an isolated workbench. That is a workbench where as few things as possible are referenced to earth ground. Now this is the workbench that I work uh, on most of my projects on, and it's a, a wooden table. It's totally non-conducting, at least at the voltages that we're dealing with. And as I mentioned before, it's sitting on a tile floor, which for the most part is a reasonably good insulator. It will conduct a small amount of current, but most, uh, for most conditions, not enough to be hazardous. Now my equipment on this workbench is also isolated. I've actually lifted the ground from everything on this uh, bench so that nothing on this bench is directly referenced to earth ground. So if I'm working on something and I accidentally brush my hand against my laptop screen, I won't accidentally conduct current through and, uh, and get a shock off of that. So this is another uh, place where, like I mentioned when I was sticking the screwdriver into the outlet, it's very important to be aware of the paths that current can take around you and how you can avoid making yourself part of that path. Now an alternative method for doing this is actually quite the opposite. You can ground everything in your workstation and then make sure that you never come in contact with a device unless that device has already shorted itself out to ground. This creates the condition where if something faults out to the chassis of a device and you have it grounded, it immediately trips the breaker or blows the fuse. Now I don't prefer this system because it can be quite annoying to change fuses and it can present an arc flash or fire hazard if short circuits occur. This is why I personally prefer the fully isolated workbench. So when I'm working on high voltage, uh, or me, I should say low voltage, sub 600 volt uh, elevated voltage circuits, I always prefer to work on a bench where I'm going to be uh, personally not in the path of the flow of current if I accidentally touch one part of the circuit. Now, of course, if I touch more than one part of the circuit, this creates a hazard in and of itself, which I'm going to show you in a minute. I'll use this uh, test board where you can attach different alligator clips to different points as an example of something that I might be working on which contains elevated voltage that could be hazardous and present an electric shock hazard when in use. 
Now, as, uh, as I mentioned before, being at an isolated workbench, I'm in no danger to touch either one of these at a given time. However, if I were to touch both of those connections at the same time, I would receive the same shock across my hand that I would if I, were, uh, if I had my hand on one side going to ground. Now, across one hand, this is only a, an inconvenience. It could pre uh, present a minor burn hazard or over long term could cause nerve damage, but in and of itself is not likely to be fatal. However, if I had two hands in the circuit and I touched two things in it at the same time, that could be extremely dangerous because now you're conducting current across your entire body. This is why one of the best uh, pr practices when working with live circuits is to the best of your ability, only put one hand in the circuit at a time. Now, sometimes this isn't entirely realistic because you may have to hold a board steady while you manipulate something on it. But uh, if, you have to, if you have to keep your hands in the circuit, be sure that whatever hand is not working on the active elements is as far away from the high voltage parts as possible. And preferably, if you can afford to do it, turn off the power if you're going to be working on it. Now, some, uh, some people will consider this actually to be an antiquated method. Uh, it's a lot of older electricians and electrical workers will advise the one hand in the circuit method, whereas a lot of newer standards will recommend not working live at all to begin with and wearing well insulated rubber, uh, rated rubber gloves for uh, working in live circuits. And this is also a, certainly a valid pr uh, procedure, but sometimes it can be quite cumbersome and can actually create greater hazards. For example, if you're working with a bunch of wires in a junction box and you're wearing gloves, sometimes it can be difficult to manipulate them and if you accidentally drop one and it hits the side of the box, you can then create an arc flash and a short circuit hazard. So that's going to lead into another thing that I'm going to discuss as well, which is if you're working on multiple wires that are hanging loosely in a circuit, be sure and only manipulate one wire at a time. If it's live, you want to make sure that it has no chance of, or at least as little chance as possible of contacting something that's grounded or otherwise at uh, reference potential to that cable. So if I'm connecting something or if I'm turning on and off this switch, I want to make sure that my, uh, I'm not doing two things at once where another wire could fall down onto that switch and cause a, a short circuit. Now this is a, a fused board, I have a 15 amp fuse here, but nevertheless, it would still create a big flash and would not be ideal if a short circuit were to occur. So that's another bit of uh, safety information for electrical safety and how to protect yourself against electric shock. As I mentioned, the one hand rule is, while I consider it useful, may not be uh, widely accepted by some electricians or electrical workers in favor of just using rated electrically insulative uh, protective, personal protective equipment. The last thing I want to talk about today, and this is probably one of the most relevant things to hobbyist electronics enthusiasts who might not even think that they're actually working on elevated voltage, is the hazard of capacitors. Now every switched mode power supply you take apart will have a large mains filter capacitor after its uh, first stage rectifier. Now I haven't shown that here, but this is just a regular air conditioner capacitor. Now any electronic device with a large high voltage capacitor may have the potential for that capacitor to hold charge for a considerably lengthy amount of time. Now this capacitor looks fairly innocuous, right? I mean, you could take this wire off. It looks like it's just been sitting around in your closet. You have no way of knowing if there was any, uh, any real hazard with it, but it would be easy to assume that this is fairly uh, non-hazardous since it's just been sitting around. In reality, however, this capacitor is still holding 160 volts from where I charged it, and it can deliver potentially hundreds of amps for a split second. Now, that's a pretty big bang you got there. If I had stuck my fingers across that before doing that, I would have been in for a pretty rough time so it's very important to make sure you discharge any capacitors that are uh, in circuit or not in circuit before you work on them, uh, particularly if they're high voltage capacitors. As you can see, this is a 440 volt capacitor unpolarized, meaning it could store up to a 440 volt or even potentially slightly higher charge without actually discharging itself over time. So definitely important to remember capacitors in any circuit you're working on, particularly if you're working on a power supply. So hopefully this video was relatively informative and gave you a, a brief introduction into the ways in which you can try to improve your safety if you're working on a, any sort of a live electrical condition or electrical system 
whether you're testing a power supply or working on something that's supposed to be off but may have uh, high voltage components that you didn't realize are present or for whatever reason is uh, energized. Now I don't advocate wor working in live systems if you don't have to. It's always better to try to shut down the system first. And as I mentioned at the be beginning of the video, I'm not a uh, licensed or certified technician, electrician, or any sort of uh, certified electrical worker. So what I've, what I've mentioned in this video is just from my own experience, from my own research, and what I have found to be the safest practices in my own operation and work, of, uh, work on electronics. So you really should do your own research and don't work on anything you don't feel comfortable working around or don't feel experienced enough in working around. Uh, one of the common expressions is you can be just, just knowledgeable enough to be dangerous. So you want to be sure that just because you have a little bit of knowledge about electrical safety, you definitely want to work your way up understanding how electricity works from uh, on a low voltage fundamental level before you start messing around with elevated voltages that could be hazardous to your health. I also, what I didn't mention earlier in the video is if you're working on a project where other people's lives could be put in danger, for example, the grounding system on a metal chassis machine, you have to be absolutely certain that you know what you're doing and you're not setting up or creating a bigger hazard for someone else as well. So hopefully this was somewhat informative. I hope that you learned something and I'm hoping in general that this makes you a more safe electrical worker and a more safe electrical enthusiast. And uh, I'm, thank you for watching my video. I'll see you in a future video on uh, some other electric, uh, electronics topic. I'm thinking probably electric motors is going to be my uh, next video. So thanks for watching Dielectric Videos, and I will see you next time.